In this lesson, we'll be looking at an improved version of the LFSR stream cipher, which we can obtain by combining more than one LFSR generator together. So LFSR ciphers, as we've seen, are great at producing statistically random key streams, but as we just saw in our previous lesson, are very susceptible to known plaintext attacks. But turns out that by combining multiple LFSR systems together can create a system that's more resilient to known plaintext attacks and also have a longer period in the random digits that are being created. We'll do this by XORing the two LFSR output streams together to generate a new key stream, and we'll call this method the LFSR sum stream cipher. We'll do this by first defining two LFSR systems, and this is just an example, but we could expand out to other sized systems, but for now we'll look at a 3-bit LFSR and a 5-bit LFSR that have the following definitions. Our 3-bit system would be obtained by taking the previous bit number 1 and bit number 2, denoted by b1 and b2, added together mod 2 in order to determine the new value for bit 3. For our 5-bit LFSR system, we'll do this similarly. Here we'll use the letter C instead of the letter B, so we can keep track of the bits 1 and 2 uh, for the different LFSR systems respectively. And the definition for this 5-bit system will be that we'll take the previous bit 1, 2, and 4, add them together in mod by 2 in order to determine the new value for bit number 5. We'll communicate the seed values using a 6-digit key, or 6 bits of information. For our example here, we'll use 011010. And the first two bits will be used for setting the seed value of our 3-bit system. Uh, they'll seed the values for bit 2 and bit 3. And then the second uh, round of bits, so the last four bits of our key, will be used for seeding the 5-bit LFSR. So that 1010 will set the bit values for bits 5, 4, 3, and 2, respectively. Both LFSRs will have their first bit always set equal to the value of 1. And this is to help avoid the situation where any one of these LFSRs uh, has a state where all the values of the bits in a particular row are set to 0. So you might have seen in a previous lesson that when that happens, it's, we're kind of set and stuck in that state. We can't get out of it, and our pseudo, number, uh, pseudo random number generator no longer works. And the last piece of information we need is how are we going to combine these two uh, LFSR outputs to generate our key stream for encryption? We'll do that by taking off, just like we've seen before, the first two bits from each of the LFR systems, add and mod by two, to generate the first bit of our key stream. So let's take a look at how this will work in practice. Let's start by looking at the way the LFSR 3-bit system will work. So we'll take our seed value of 0, 1, and as we mentioned, we'll put those into the positions of 0 and 1, so bit 3 and bit 2 in our table here, and we can follow those calculations down to complete this system. For the 5-bit, we could do the same thing. We'll take our 1, 0, 1, 0, set those to be the values for bits 5, 4, 3, and 2, have that value of 1 for the set for bit number 1, and we can apply these rules to fill out our table, and now we have two output streams, one for each of these LFSR systems. We'll line up our outputs. Here we are. We'll notice that the LFSR3, uh, if you were to follow that along, has a period of seven, meaning every seven bits we come back to the beginning of the cycle, and the next seven bits will be the same as the seven bits that preceded it. Our LFSR5, our five-bit system, has a period of 15, so every 15 bits of information that are generated, the pattern will start over. Now, if we XOR these two output streams together, we'll get the key stream that we'll actually use for encryption. And one note about this key stream is that it has a period of 105, and in fact that 105 comes from it being the least common multiple of the individual periods of the component systems. So 7 and 15, their least common multiple is 105. Now that adds a nice security feature in that we can take two simple LFSR systems and combine them in this method to create one with a much longer period uh, than it would be able to create just one uh, more complex LFSR system to get the same period. So there's some, some simplicity here of the individual components and we can actually XOR them together pretty, pretty easily to generate this more complex system. Say we take the first 16 bits from that key stream and we'll use that to encrypt two pieces of plain text here, uh, lowercase n, lowercase c. Here we can see that we have the ASCII representation of that plain text written out in binary, 
and we can XOR the key stream with the plain text to determine our ciphertext message in binary, which happens to turn into the ciphertext uh, slash T or the tab button on your keyboard, and then a left curly brace. So those are the two characters in ASCII that those convert to. And that is kind of, in essence, what the LFSR sum cipher will do. It, it, it operates in the end very similarly to a similar or a sim simple one LFSR system, but we'll see it does add some security, and it's not just from increasing the length of the period. We'll see how this is a little bit more resilient to a known plaintext attack in the next part of this lesson. So let's take a look about how this system is a bit more secure than just using one single LFSR cipher on its own. So here's the ciphertext and the plaintext that we just deduced from the last page. And we can XOR those together. Say we were able to guess that first character of the plaintext, and we XOR that with the ciphertext we intercepted. We could determine the key stream, those eight, first eight bits of our key stream here. Now, with a single LSFR, LFSR, we were able to kind of work that backwards and determine the seed value. And once we had the seed value, we had enough information to go ahead and generate as much of the key stream as we needed to deduce the rest of our plaintext message. Let's see why that doesn't work in this particular system. If we have our key stream, here is a possible combination of LFSR3 outputs and LFSR5 outputs that would have generated that key stream if we were to XOR those together. So that's one possible way that we could have had the LFSR outputs. And if those that was the correct possible pairing, we could work those individually back to get the seed values for the 3-bit and the 5-bit systems. But we don't know for sure that that's a actual correct output pairing, because here's yet another one. Notice that this is a completely different pairing of outputs from an LFSR3 and an LFSR5 system, but they would have produced the key same key stream. And that's kind of the crux of the added security here. Just knowing the key stream that was used to encrypt the ciphertext doesn't give us any particular information about either one of the LFSR output streams. You could have gotten to that zero in the key stream by having a one and a one in both the three and the five bit system, or a zero and a zero in the three and the five bit systems. You could have gotten to that one in the key stream by having a one and a zero, or a zero and a one. This multiple opportunities to get to the same key stream value is what adds the security. Without having some additional information about the individual LFSR outputs, there's no way to determine which values each of those LFSR systems use to get to the key stream. Now, we will see, however, in just a moment, that there's still a way to crack this cipher if you know some of the key stream. So here's how we can begin to recover the seed values for our individual LFSR systems. Here we'll take a look at our 3-bit system that uses the same definition that we saw before. We could obtain bit, the value for bit 3 by looking at the preceding rows values for bits 1 and 2 and XORing them together, or just adding mod 2. But instead of having the actual values for the seed, we're going to use these placeholders of K1 and K2, where K1 is the initial value for bit 3 and K2 is the initial value for bit 2. And we're going to set up a system where ultimately we'll be able to solve for these two values. And once we do, we'll have the seed for this LFSR, and we can generate as much of the keystream or of its output that contributes to the keystream that we might need. So we'll keep applying the rules like we have done in the past to generate subsequent rows of our table. Again, we don't have the actual values for K1 and K2, so we'll use them as variables to produce expressions for those values in the table. And here we'll see that this pattern in column 3 for bit 3, uh, we can simplify a little bit using some rules of modular arithmetic. Normally we would take the preceding value for bit 1, which is 1 plus k2, add that to the value for bit 2, which is k1 plus k2, and when we combine like terms we would have had the expression 1 plus k1 plus 2 times k2. But if we were to mod that expression by 2, it would simplify down to just 1 plus k1 because we know that doubling k2 and then taking the mod 2 of that will always result in that being equivalent to 0. And if you're not quite sure of that logic, uh, you could try a couple of values of k2. If k2 were 0, we'd have 2 times 0, which is equivalent to 0 in mod 2. But if we had 2 times 1, the result would be 2, and 2 is also equivalent to 0 in mod 2. So it doesn't matter the value of k2, twice k2 will always be equivalent to 0 as long as you're working with the modulus of 2. And that fact here will be the crux of much of our simplification that we can use for the rest of this process. We can see it again in the next row. 
If we were to take bit one and bit two from the preceding row and add them together, we'd have one plus two times k1 plus two times k2. And using the same logic from the previous row, we know that that's just equivalent to one in mod two. And we have the rest of our table now filled out. We're gonna set this aside, but we will come back and specifically look at the values of bit one in this column, and more specifically the expressions for those bits since we don't have numerical values for most of the rows. But since they are the output of this three bit system that we'll be using to generate the key stream, Let's look at the same process now for our 5-bit system. Again, we have the same definition as before, and we'll start to fill in the rows to compute new values or expressions for those values for these bits. Like we've seen in the past, we can simplify some of these rows in order to reduce down their expressions to the simplest form. And we're gonna take a look at that column for C1, since those are the bits that will be combined with the column for B1, our th from the outputs from our 3-bit system, to generate our key stream. Let's collect all that information all in one place. Here's the expressions that represent the first seven bits output from each of the 3-bit and the 5-bit LFSR systems. And if we were to add those together, we can simplify those down as well to obtain the following expressions. So we now know with the first seven bits from our LFSR sum, which in theory should be our key stream that we're using to encrypt the message. Assuming that we now know the seed values, we could just plug and chug here and determine the following zeros and ones for this LFSR sum. Now, how is this useful to us? Well, as we've seen previously, is that if we can guess a piece of plain text and we intercept the corresponding ciphertext, we can use that to compute the actual key stream that we believe to be true. And now we can set up a system of equivalencies, knowing that the first bit in the key stream that we got from our guess at the plain text and the intercepted, intercepted ciphertext would match up with the first bit from the LS, LFSR system with the given definitions that we have. And then likewise, the second bit corresponds with our expression in the second bit placeholder, third with third, and so on. So the key stream that we have from the known plain text should correspond to the values, the theoretical values, that these expressions will compute for the LFSR, LFSR sum with the given definitions for this system. And let's see how that's helpful. We can use all of those correspondences to set up what's called a system of congruences. It's like a system of equations, but just in a particular modulus. So for example, I would know that K2 plus K6 is congruent to 1 in mod 2. How did I know that? Let's go back a previous slide. It's because bit one is K2 plus K6 from the computed LFSR sum system, and I have a computed key stream value of one, so I know that those should be congruent. We can set up similar congruences for the remaining bits, so we know that K1 plus K5 is congruent to one mod two, one plus K2 plus K4 is congruent to one, K1 plus K2 plus K3 is congruent to one, K's 1, 2, 4, and 6 is congruent to 0, and 1 plus K1 plus K3 plus K5 plus K6 is congruent to 0. So we've got a lot of different equations here, but the good news is we have six unknowns, K's 1 through 6, and we have six equations or, or equivalent statements that govern those relationships. And if you remember from solving equations in any other math course you've taken, that should be enough for us to determine all the values of these unknowns. In fact, solving systems of congruences like this, more specifically linear congruences, is something that a computer is really good at. So we won't focus too much of this course on trying to figure out how we can do this manually. We'll let the computer take care of this work most of the time, as it'll be much more accurate and certainly quicker than what we could do by hand. But let's take a look at this one in particular that we can solve by hand due to a unique setup that these equations set up, uh, form for us. So we're actually gonna add all six of these equations together because I've noticed a pattern here in the coefficients for each of these terms. We'll see that when we add up, and there's a reason why we had these grouped the way they are on the, on the screen with their individual like terms uh, lined up above each other, is that if we were to add the column that had our constants of one, we'll see that we have an even number of those terms spread out across the six equations. Two of them, and only two of them, had a term with a constant in it. And if I were to add those two together, they would equivalent, be equivalent to zero in mod two. Again, applying the same logic that we saw before. Likewise, if we were to add up another column here, say with the K2 values, there's four of those. 
and four K2s are equivalent to zero mod two, regardless of whatever value K2 ends up being equivalent to. Whether it's a zero or a one, that statement is the same. And we can apply that logic all the way down the line. K1s, there's four of those. There's two K3s, two K4s, two K5s. The only terms that have an odd number spread out across all six of these is the K6 column. So we have three K6s, which is equivalent to just one K6 when we mod by two. Again, we're kind of reducing that by two which allows us to create a much simpler equation once we add all these up, just that K6 is, a, is congruent to zero in mod two. We now have one piece of information that we can now use to apply to other equations in that system to start solving for other values of K. So if we know that K2 plus K6 is congruent to one, and we now know that K6 is congruent to zero, we really know that K2 plus zero is congruent to one, which implies that K2 itself is congruent to one. And now we've got a second piece of information. Applying that to another equation in the system, we now know that one plus K2 plus K4 is congruent to one. And when we substitute one in for K2, we're able to deduce that K4 itself is congruent to one. And we're gonna keep applying this over and over again until we have all six values for these six different Ks that we were looking for. And at this point, we have all of the seeds that we need for both of the LFRs, LFSR systems. And if we have the seeds, we can compute the output for those two systems and combine them together to generate the key stream that we need. So even though it wasn't as straightforward as when we intercept a ciphertext and have a guess at the known plain text with just one LFSR, we can't just work it backwards directly to get the seed values. We can always set up the system of congruences in order to combine these equations together and solve for the seed values this way. It's important to note out that note that this system really works well for us because all of these LFSR systems are in fact linear. That's the L in LFSR. If these were to be combined in a different way, where we didn't have just sums of these k values, but perhaps multiplicative terms, so like k2 times k6 instead of k2 plus k6, this would be a much more complex mathematical problem and add much more security to the system. We'll see in our next lesson that that's exactly what's been done in the past to attempt to encrypt from pretty sensitive information using the content scrambling system. That's it for the, this lesson on LFSR sum stream ciphers. At this point, you should know how to still use a known plaintext attack in order to set up a system of linear congruences that you can use to solve for the individual seed values and in the individual LFSRs.